but yes, I'm a PhD student at Rutgers. And today I'd like to present you my ongoing project, which uses a new method called Massively Parallel Reporter Assays, or MPRAs, for characterizing non-coding mutations. And we used it specifically to analyze and see if any of these non-coding mutations were involved in autism. So starting with the disease background itself, autism spectrum disorder or ASD is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it is a disorder where its functional effect is happening as the brain is still developing and you only see the functional effects later on when after the child is born. It is a quite prevalent disorder. The CDC has estimated about one in 54 children are diagnosed with ASD and multiple studies have come out and a recent study that I was able to find reported that approximately 80% of all ASD cases are caused by genetic factors. So that leads us to want to try and figure out if we can find any of these genetic factors for autism. So to do that, we wanted to investigate neural progenitor cells or NPCs because those are the cells that you will find in the developing brain tissue. And that is a good starting place to see because that is where the functional effects occur and to see if we can find any genetic factors at play in them. So for the genetic background itself on the non-coding region, the majority of genome-wide association, association studies or GWAS studies have reported that mutations known as single nucleotide polymorphisms, the vast majority of them map to non-coding regions, which makes sense because non-coding regions make up the vast majority of one's DNA, as it is sites where the DNA is not actively transcribed into a protein. However, that is not to say that is not important. In these non-coding regions, we have very important structures that are known as regulatory sequences. These include promoters and enhancers. And what they do is they help bind with multiple factors to make a transcription complex, which aids in letting the gene be transcribed and expressed. So we wanted to analyze these regions to see if mutations could have an effect on the complex and affect the amount of gene being expressed to see if that can be associated with causing autism phenotype. So the focus of our study exactly is two pronged. The first is that we're trying to see if mutations, we want to focus on our study on promoters. So we want to see if mutations in promoters are causing autism phenotype and if we can see it. And secondarily, we wanted to see if any of our variants that we're finding as significant are part of any regulatory elements such as transcription factor binding sites or conserved loci sites. So for the study itself, we and our collaborators helped us, we got whole genome sequencing from the Simon Simplex collection. That is a collection database of autism families where it's made up of two unaffected parents, a unaffected control sibling and the affected or case patient. So our collaborators went through the database of whole genome sequences and pulled out de novo variants. These are variants that are found in the individual and not in the other three members of its family. And we pulled out de novo variants for the patients or for unaffected, unaffected siblings so that we could have a set of case variants and a set of control variants. What we then did was we took the variant and got the 200 base pair region surrounding that variant. And we generated both the sequence found in the individual, as well as the reference sequence. And we call these the candidate regulatory sequences. And our goal is to compare the amount of gene expression for the alternate allele, as well as the reference allele and compare the two to see if this variant is causing a change in the amount of gene expression. So to do that, we are using the massively parallel reporter assay or MPRA design. What this does is it takes those 200 base pair sequences or CRSs and puts it in this MPRA design, which also includes a minimal promoter and barcodes. 
what this allows us to do is it allows us to use lenti lentiviruses to infect certain cells and then send those off for DNA and RNA sequencing. And that will allow us to see how these sequences are affecting the amount of transcription of these barcodes. So for robustness, we have multiple types of controls. The first type of control is we have three technical replicates, which means we took these designs and infected it into three sets of our cells, which are the NPC cells that I had mentioned earlier. The NPC, NPC cells that we use specifically are one month old cells derived from embryonic, embryonic stem cells. To make sure that we were able to see positive gene expression and negative gene expression, we gathered 150 sequences that have been associated with H3K27 acetylation, which is an epigenetic marker for open DNA and open transcription. So we know that these sites would provide us with a positive or a high actively expressed amount of gene expression. And then we took those sequences, scrambled them so that they would have no meaning and use those as negative controls. So we could see the range of active transcription and non-active transcription. So we would know that the design is working. For the design SNPs itself, or design variants, I should say, we have 923 sequence pairs. And sequence pairs, I mean the reference and alternate allele pairs. We took 923 of them from promoters that were found at conserved loci sites, which are sites that are more intolerable to evolutionary mutation. So they're more likely to be deleterious if changed. We also took 2,677 sequence pairs from promoters that were not at conserved loci sites, but instead were found by Dawn or Lasso categories. Dawn is a neural network prediction model and Lasso is a Lasso regression prediction model, which both are two different methods of predicting which of these variants could be affecting the autism phenotype. So once we sent them off for DNA and RNA sequencing, we use two main programs to analyze the data. The first is MPRA flow, which takes the multiple barcodes and associates them with the candidate sequence so that we can attribute the read counts back to the sequences because those are what we care about. After we've associated it, we count the number of barcodes in the sequence and then associate it back so we have the number for candidate sequences. From there, we change the data. So instead of all of the sequences being compared to each other, we then change it so that it's only comparing the reference allele sequence to the alternate allele sequence. And then we put it into MPRA Analyze to do differential expression of this type of data. So what MPR Analyze does is it takes the ratio of RNA barcode counts over the DNA barcode counts to normalize for differing amounts of DNA, which would cause a differing amount of RNA even without actual effects. So once it has that ratio, it takes the average over all the barcodes to get a single transcription activity number for candidate sequence. And then it does a differential expression analysis to see how much of a change is occurring between the sequences and how significant it is. After we use different thresholds to get a significant group, we then used Fisher exact test to find if any regulatory sequence or regulatory element is significant or enriched in those areas. And then we plan to do regression model to see if any of those categories, which whether or not they were found in rich in our significance, are able to influence the amount of change between these alleles. So starting with the design SNPs, we started with 3,600 uh, sequence pairs. After filtering for sequence length, quality, minimum number of barcode reads, 
and one or two other filters, we ended up with 3,090 reference pairs to compare. What we found was that 124 of these sequence pairs, which are denoted in the red values in the volcano plot on the right, have a larger than 25% change in expression between the reference and alternate alleles. This is what we call the large expression change significant category. And we also have a category of 123 sequen sequence pairs, which are denoted by the triangles that have a less than 0.1 false discovery rate or FDR value from MPRA analyze. The FDR value is used to denote how confident the program is in the expression difference that it's showing. So we use these two categories to look to see if we have any enrichment in regulatory elements. So we use this um, matrix file to see what we could find enrichment with, which can be broken into three sections. The first is information on the variance itself, such as position, allele, MPR analyze, p-value scores, and expression differences, as well as whether or not it came from an unaffected sibling control or from an autism patient. The second category is the DAWN category, which is the neural network prediction model, which denotes different cluster of genes that have associated with ASD characteristics. Um, if you'd like to know more, I would point you towards the 2014 paper that originally describes these categories. And then finally, and most importantly, the actual regulatory element categories themselves, which include the conserved loci sites, active transcription sites, as well as transcription factor binding sites, the H3K27 acetylation sites, to see if any of these categories can be enriched. And what we found using Fisher exact tests was that both of these categories or both significant groups were able to find enrichment for the active transcription sites, conserved loci sites, transcription factor binding sites, and DNA sites. However, it was not able to find any significance with the phenotype, which is saying that it is able to find that the NPR analyze was finding significant SNPs that were part of important regulatory elements but it was not able to find any functional significance of whether or not these variants were part of involved in autism or not. So as I mentioned, this is an ongoing project. So for next steps, we want to do regression models to see if any of those regulatory element categories are influencing how much expression difference is happening between the reference and alternate alleles, even if it's not making them significant if they still have some effects in it. A second analysis we want to do is look at the genes that these variants in our significant groups come from and see if they have a high level of expression in developing brain tissue as opposed to other tissues. Because in those cases, that will provide us with additional evidence that even though Fisher Exact wasn't able to tell us it was involved with the autism phenotype, if it's still involved in high expression brain tissue genes, then it could still have evidence for functional effects. And then finally, as I mentioned, we started with 3,600 pairs after filtering, we had 3,000, but we only had about 120 significant value or significant pairs. So our problem is we seem to be underpowered. So Another analysis we plan to do is to repeat this with a larger sample size to increase our power, which might also give us a significant um, enrichment for phenotype in terms of the Fisher exact. But that's something we'd have to look into. I would like to finish up by thanking my PI, Dr. Anat Kramer, our main collaborator, Dr. Stefan Sanders, as well as a UCSF PI, Nadav, and the postdocs, Taka and Junan, who have moved on to independent positions at these universities for helping us gather and generate the data. 
And with that, I would like to ask if anyone has any questions.